Greetings, everyone. My name is Tiffany Oliver. I serve as an advisor in the Office of Global Food Security at the U.S. State Department, and I bring you welcomes to our October Vax Community of Practice webinar. The community of practice is an integral part of implementing the objectives of Vax and has allowed us to broaden in the input that we receive from the general public, nonprofits, corporations, and others regarding the execution of the VAX initiative. This is important as it helps us better understand the needs of scientists and organizations that are working to reduce the impact of climate change on global food security. This month's webinar will be led by Climate AI and is entitled, Looking at Climate Change Adaption Through the Lens of the Public and Private Sector. And so at this time, I would like to welcome our partners from Climate AI and turn it over to you all. Great, thank you so much, Tiffany. And thank you all for <clears throat> uh, giving us this, uh, this slot today. And um, for, uh, for those of you joining from uh, wherever you're joining from. My name is Will Clutter. I'm the Vice President of Operations and Strategy at Climate AI. Um, Climate AI works with companies largely in the food and agricultural space all over the world um, using AI to further climate resilience um, in our food system. And as part of my role, I work with, I, I support our customer team. So I work with all of our customers who are actually implementing our technology into the into various parts of the food and agricultural value chain, um, which is something I've spent most of my career doing um, in one form or another in a variety of different roles and um, climate, sustainability, public policy, um, and uh, entrepreneurship. Um, so I'm gonna pull up my screen here and what I'm gonna focus on today is um, a few key points. One is how we see some of the challenges of climate change manifesting um, in, in the food system, which I imagine is probably not going to be a lot of new information for you all, but I think what, what, what I'd like to bring to the conversation is um, what are, how is this showing up in, in the eyes of our private, largely private sector clients? And then um, how can AI play a role in increasing in responding to those challenges and increasing resiliency? Um, we've got quite a bit of time here and I don't expect to go too long. So I would encourage folks to drop any questions that they have uh, into the into the chat. Um, I will, for the most part, probably wait until the end uh, to address them. But if I see so if I see one pop up, I'll try and uh, maybe take a break and uh, answer things uh, answer things midway. But very much um, open to this being a, a dialogue as we move through. Um, so to start, you know, when we think about climate change, we think about it across three different dimensions. We think about the intensity of, <clears throat> of events. So the example here showing heat waves, but in, in here in the US, we've had um, a, a hurricane season um, with extremely strong hurricanes that have um, increased in intensity very, very quickly. And that's the type of um, sort of more intense extreme event. Then we think about increased frequency. Um, so in a lot of our modeling, we, we like to tell customers, this extreme event that's coming is a once in 10 year and once in 20 year event. Except the once in 10 or 20 years had happened to be last year because these events that were rare are no longer rare. <clears throat> and then this point, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, this point of variability as well, this rapid oscillation between um, good or bad years or ex extremely wet years or extremely dry years, like we see this example of New South Wales. We have a lot of customers in Australia who've been dealing with this whiplash of are we going to be inundated or are we not going to have um, enough water to, to produce grains? Um, so it's across these three dimensions that, that we see um, the, the challenge of climate change coming and the challenge to our, um, our global food system. One thing I also sort of add, want to add to those points is this concept of timing and this non-uniformity of timing. So this is an analysis that we did for a global seed company looking at um, a lot of their top seed production regions. And we, we did this analysis that we call a tipping point, which is when does the average fundamentally change? Or, or um, to sort of, in, to speak in mathematical terms, when is a 25th percentile um, event become the 75th percentile? So the, the box plot basically just shifts, shifts up. And what we see here is there's a very wide array of 
of timings across um, across some of their key markets. But what I want to call out here is if you look at the, U the U.S., Washington, Northern California, and Central California, all effectively Western United States locations, not very far away from each other, have dramatically different um, set of timings as when we see this new normal arriving. And in a lot of ways, what our customers experience is it's less the impact of negative events than it's the volatility or the uncertainty and the inability to plan. So let me give this example here of, of barley. Um, <clears throat> what, we, what we're showing here is what we're calling a, a key inflection point for yield volatility, which is effectively the way we're measuring that is when, when in yield volatility, so the, you know, uh, when yield volatility as measured by standard deviation will increase by, by one standard deviation. Um, so when does that volatility sort of uh, take that next step? And what is the timing of that move, of that increase in standard deviation? Um, and what we see here is sort of that same uncertainty that, that we were discussing on the previous slide. So if you look at something like Argentina, we would expect things to move in, in relatively, a relatively uniform manner and thankfully not very soon. But if you look at the United States or France, um, and here in the United States, we're, we're focusing on sort of the Idaho, um, Idaho region, um, we see a tremendous variability between, um, you know, the, in the U.S. example, the sort of green, green island here of way out in the future, to a lot of the, that key agricultural production region experiencing this movement in standard deviation, this increase in volatility, effectively right now. And so what we see from our customers is, you know, if you, if you tell me I'm in this Australia example, where it's all kind of moving uniformly um, around, uh, you know, within the next decade, let's say, there's a lot of actions that our, that our customers can take. They can think about growing new varieties or new crops, new practices, maybe moving to different pockets within the country um, or expanding operations. Um, they can think about, hey, you know, overall, we can expect less output from this than from this region. So we need to figure out how we're going to get those volumes elsewhere and develop um, develop new emerging regions. Um, we'll talk all about all of these tools that um, that they can implement uh, a little bit later on. But the point is, there, there's a bit more certainty there. Whereas in this U.S. or France example, it's going to be very difficult for customers sourcing from those regions or farmers growing in those regions to understand what is going to happen? And if you don't have that certainty, it's very difficult to make a plan. The other thing I want to highlight, and I'm again, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm speaking to the um, to the choir here, is that we're not just talking about yields; we're talking about um, other factors that imp impact uh, health and nutrition of food. Uh, in this case, uh, the potential for um, mycotoxin contamination from uh, Fusarium uh, fungi. And again, using the North America as an example here. So um, I, as folks are um, very possibly aware, mycotoxins are, are uh, toxins that can emerge from different types of fungi, including the Fusarium um, fungus that we're showing here. Um, these things can have a very meaningful threat to, to human health, things that you know we would, uh, kidney damage, cancer, a very long list of very bad things. Um, it's, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of testing that gets done to screen for these contaminated um, foods. So it's not like these are necessarily running rampant in the food system today, um, but there are, there are billions and billions of dollars spent on testing and ultimately food waste when contaminated batches of wheats and other staple food crops are, are thrown out. Um, and this is not just a U.S. problem that we're focused on the U.S. in this example. What we see is 25 percent of food and 45 percent of feed may have these types of fungi that can cause um, these um, these mycotoxins. So what causes this fungi in the first place is um, warm human condition uh, conditions during the flowering period. And what we're going to see as I sort of click through here is the where this this risk of fusarium is going to how that's going to increase as we flip through by decade. So you can see on the overall map, and then on sort of the zoom ins we have here, that I, the the further we go, the more we see this risk increasing. 
So where does that leave us? It leave us, leaves us with more intense, more frequent, um, more variable events with a high uncertainty of timing and a significant impact. So what do we do? Well, as I've been saying before, a lot of what we see our value is, is in trying to reduce the uncertainty around these impacts, trying to provide more information sooner to key decision makers in both the public and private sector so that they can make a plan. I think what we've seen in our work, and I'm sure you've seen in yours, is that farmers are creative and resilient, and if given the right information and the right resources, can adapt. But in absence of, of the right information, it's very difficult, as I said, to make a plan. And that's where Climate AI comes in. So uh, Climate AI is the leading climate insights platform, and we're focused on linking weather and climate forecasting to, um, we often say sort of business value, but in this context, let's say overall societal value or resiliency value. The way our, our technology works is um, it exists in two layers. The first is our fundamental forecast layer, which was developed at Stanford University um, in 2017. And then really for the first three years of our existence, we were 100% focused on core technology development. What is that technology? It is um, AI and machine learning uh, methods for improving forecast accuracy out to six months. So a seasonal forecast, because a lot of the uncertainty and variability reduction that I'm talking about have to do with more information sooner, which means the traditional two week weather forecast is insufficient to meet that challenge. The other key piece of the technology is looking at long-term climate, 10, 20, 30 years, 50 years into the future to help people understand the new normal that is, that is coming. What we found is that existing models um, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other sources, um, sources like that are excellent models, great tools for policymakers to measure directional changes um, in, you know, if we emit X, uh, if we hit the Paris Accords, if we don't, what does that mean in terms of warming potential and then general trends in temperature increases? But they're not really designed to give absolute correct absolute values to decision makers, which makes them very, which means they have very high uncertainty, very coarse resolution, and very difficult to plan around. So with machine learning, with our machine learning technology, we've taken those existing forecast streams, um, compared them to actuals in real time, and evaluated which are the most accurate for each parameter for a given location, and come up with a, a long-term model that is not just directionally correct on the trends, but delivers um, meaningfully accurate absolute values at much lower uncertainties that allows you um, to plan for this, this new climate normal. In 2020 is when <clears throat> we made the decision to commercialize our technology and we focused on food and agriculture for reasons that will be obvious to anyone on this call. It is an incredibly weather dependent industry. The scale of the challenge was extremely large and it was very motivating to um, to our two co-founders, one of whom grew up in a rural village in India with insufficient access to, to water, and the other who grew up in an agricultural family in Ecuador. And so there are sort of two life experiences. Um, and then, you know, mine and the other folks who joined kind of early were all motivated by this, um, by applying this technology to a space where we thought we could have a significant impact. Since that time, we've, we've grown to over 50 customers, um, operating in 70 countries, their technology has been packed, patented and, and recognized. And, um, and I'll sort of in the next part of this presentation, talk a little bit about how we deploy that technology to address some of the challenges I, I just spoke about earlier. Here, just to give a very quick glimpse, um, when I say we work in food and agriculture, we really work across the spectrum from input providers providing seeds, major growers and producers, large food and beverage and processors sourcing from all over the world, um, and then also on the finance um, on the finance side, um, financing whether it's um, you know equity debt um, development et cetera. <clears throat> so this, when we think about climate resiliency, this is how this is the approach that we take with with our customers, and and I think is a useful framework um, for really any resiliency journey. We start with this concept of a strategic assessment of climate risk. This is sort of thinking overall, 
what is the new normal that we're tracking towards? What can we expect in the future? What is the language? How do we expect the length of seasons, the amount of rain we get during the rainy season versus the dry season? When that rainy season occurs, what do the new high temperatures look like during key periods for the crop like flowering? Fundamentally, we want to what we want to understand is, hey, we've had weird weather in the last 10 years. How much of that is genuinely representative of climate signal versus just a truly anomalous bad year? And once we can focus in on those key events that do represent this new normal, that's when we can start to plan. That's when we get into sort of the block, the second block here, talking about operationalizing resiliency. So I, I talked about this. Once we know we have these sort of key events to focus on, how do we make a plan around that? Um, at Climate AI, we have tools that are providing um, a number of different uh, user personas um, within the space uh, tools to kind of operationalize that re resiliency. So one is sort of agricultural production. So actually folks using our seasonal forecast to make decisions on the ground about planting timing or variety selection or sort of targeted inter interventions like when to run irrigation or when to uh, apply shade cloth. Of course, it's going to vary very widely by crop and, and geography. But the point is we're, that's about the folks close to the ground. Then we think about sourcing as well, sort of folks looking globally from through a variety of sourcing regions, just trying to figure out how to get enough quantity of whatever they're trying to procure um, to ensure that they are, um, they have the, they, they're able to meet sort of the, the demands for, for food all over the world. And sometimes that's a this year decision of sourcing from country A versus country B, but sometimes it's also about looking at that strategic assessment saying, hey, we don't have the, we're not going to have the volumes that we need to, to meet our demands. So we need to start developing new relationships and new regions. And the last piece, it's great if we can get all the food out of the, out of the ground, but we need to get it to the consumers. Um, and so we do a lot of work in supply chain and logistics as well, um, looking at things like disruptions to ports, disruption, sort of low river levels and key shipping lanes, or key um, uh, transportation, river transportation corridors, um, to ensure that either fertilizer can get to the field or crops can get off the field. All of these are done then to the final service of, you know, us from a for-profit perspective, we really want to link this to genuine business value. What we see and what we see from our customers is that they're strongly incented to share that value with their growers, because I think that there has been this sort of light bulb moment of we will not have enough stuff to sell food to sell, packaged goods to sell, what, what have you, beverages to sell, if we cannot increase the resiliency of our supply base and they cannot do that on their own. And so we see a lot of our customers taking these tools, reaching deeper back into their supply chain and trying to lift up their, their growers. Um, and I'll share um, an example of that in just a moment here. To kind of go a bit deeper for a moment here on, on <clears throat> what specifically climate AI does. So I talked about the strategic assessment of climate risk. Um, this is sort of our climate, our focus on our long-term um, climate tools. We used our ADAPT product to understand not just whether it's getting warmer, but specifically, you know, the key our key thresholds being breached during the flowering period for this specific type of wheat variety. So getting down to the geography, crop, and variety specific impacts, which really help provide the level of detail and confidence that um, our customers need, whether they're evaluating um, if they you know, uh, production strategies in a given area, or whether they're thinking about new traits, new seed traits that they can and should breed uh, for their customers. And we also um, have this tool we call Explore, which takes existing tools uh, or sorry, it takes your existing locations and said, where are they likely to move um, in the future? So for example, if we're, we're you know, I like to use the example of, um, of Napa Valley in, in California, um, a great region for producing wine with climate, with climate change, where, where else in the world is going to have that similar um, sort of characteristics of uh, warm days, cool nights, uh, et cetera. And we can do that for, for any crop and that helps our customers who are, trying to expand globally, enter new markets, um, whatever the case may be, understand 
hey, I'm producing here today. I know these varieties work. Where else can I scale up? Because I need to continue to, uh, to, to, to grow. I need to continue to add food and calories into the food system. On the operationalized um, resiliency piece, I talked a lot about a number of these seasonal tools. So our monitor platform focusing on day-to-day -day operations and agronomic uh, specific alerts. Um, I talked about first sourcing customers providing yield outlooks of, of key global um, global commodity crops, largely largely grains, um, but also sort of expanding into more specialty crops like um, coffee and cocoa, which are so critical for um, livelihoods in, in um, various emerging markets in the global south. And then I talked about the supply chain component here focused more on these uh, outlier type events, hurricanes and cyclones, floods, um, et cetera, that are likely to impact logistics. So I wanted to sort of, with that context, I wanted to talk about um, one of our customers, ITC in India, that has really gone through this entire journey um, and has implemented this, this additional information that we're able to provide using AI into real change on the ground to increase grower resiliency. So we started out, they came to us with a question and said, hey, we've had so much disruption in our, uh, across, so for, I guess for context, ITC is a, um, a large Indian conglomerate across a wide variety of businesses. Um, they're one of the largest ag um, agribusiness players in India. They're the largest sourcer of wheat after the Indian government. Um, and so they really are almost governmental in their size of, um, in terms of their impact on the food system. They, um, <clears throat> so they cover sort of a wide variety of crops and they came to us with this perspective of, there's so much disruption in our supply chain, help us understand what is this new normal? And not just for us, but for the world, for, you know, we, we, we're we very focused on wheat. Don't just tell us about what's gonna happen in India, tell us what's gonna happen to the rest of the world so we can start to think about the global dynamics and how that it may impact um, our, um, our growers and our business model. Within, through that exercise, <clears throat> there was a lot of different, you know, it was, it was a, a, a big engagement, a lot of different sort of outputs in terms of what ge geographies within India they should sort of think about developing, what crops may they may want to focus on, um, what traits they may need to, um, to encourage the development of. Um, lo lots of great examples here, but I want to focus on one specific example for one of the value chains, I won't say which, uh, for which crop, um, where they said, hey, Climate AI has helped us determine in the last you know, 10 years, which of the key risks that we experienced are really part of this new normal that we need to make a plan around. They called it a playbook. Their, their CEO said, hey, Climate AI has told us these events are likely to happen more often in the future. So we can no longer say that they're unexpected. This comes back to my point. Let's make a plan. It's going to be bad. We're, we're, we're getting some bad news here, but we have the news, which we didn't before. So now let's make a plan and be, and be prepared. So there was one specific risk of the timing of rainfall during the planting period for this, for this specific crop. What we saw is the monsoon was, was sort of going to carry on a little bit longer than it had historically. Um, and so they created a plan, like if we see this on the seasonal forecast, they see this event that Climate AI is talking about of more unexpected rainfall during planting, we will use our grower advisory team to advise our growers that they should shift out the planting date and plant later. We can also advise our sourcing teams to think about there may be a disruption um, to the supply for this crop in this area. So we may need to activate sort of uh, that next level of supply to ensure we get enough of this crop to, to meet on the needs of our customers. In the first year of our engagement with them, so actually only a few weeks after we concluded this report, exactly what we said would happen from a long-term perspective around this rainfall showed up in our seasonal forecast. They followed the playbook, got the growers to move the planting date. The rain came as we had forecasted it, and but the growers were largely um, unaffected because they had moved out this planting date and so avoided the the disease risk that would have, that would have come actually interesting enough, interesting enough we just heard from them last week that the same thing happened again this year 
So that's the point of this idea of information as the unlock to address new challenges and new volatility. We cannot, well, we ho I hope we can slow many of these impacts, but we also need to start thinking very seriously about how we're going to make a plan or a playbook for them. And I think this ITC example shows how we link that information to action and how we do it from a, you know, a large, from the context of a large global player reaching deep into their supply chain to share that insight and share that value, knowing that their fates are linked with those of, of their growers. I would also say ITC is probably a best in class example in, in regards to grower engagement, but this is generally indicative of a trend that we're seeing across the in industry. And I'm sure a trend that you all in your work um, uh, are either seeing or helping, helping encourage as well. Um, I just wanted to share one last example um, while we're focused on India is talking about sort of um, showing within the forecast, like, yes, we can predict these types of major disruptions. So for example, within the context of the Indian um, wheat market, there was a significant yield disruption in 2015 due to a high heat wave and then some atypical patterns of, of rainfall during harvest. The implications of that were significant concerns around domestic food insecurity um, and a uh, an import tax um, had that had been levying an export ban. So an impact not just to India, but to the global food system from this event. And what you're seeing here is for key wheat producing states, Punjab and Bihar, Climate AI's models for 2015 showing that we would have that we predicted that um, that dip. And so the point being that on a long term basis, on a seasonal basis, using um, AI, we can provide additional information to help um, can't necessarily prevent these impacts, although in the ITC example, we are able to mitigate them, but we can help prepare. Um, and that's really what we see as our, our role, is helping prepare folks like yourselves who are driving towards implementation of these solutions with the right information to, to make a plan and to be more successful. Um, so with that, uh, I'll just wrap up to sort of recap on climate AI, our you know, driving resilience across food and agriculture in the short term this season through our monitor platform and in the long term through our adapt platform. Um, and, and with that, I'm very happy to, uh, to take any, uh, any questions that have come up. Thank you, Will. So we turn it over to our attendees, any questions? You should be able to unmute yourself um, if you have a question. Also, uh, we appreciate if you could use the raise hand feature and we could acknowledge you first. Um, any questions? Yes, yes. is it? Yes. Dumisani, uh, Dumisani, uh, uh, please uh, correct me if I uh, said your name incorrectly. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Dumisani uh, from South Africa. A uh, very great presentation. And I just want to ask, um, from the presentation, it was only mentioned that um, this uh, climate AI can, you know, project uh, changes in the rainfall forecast and then advise farmers accordingly. But I just want to ask uh, in relation to PEST, does this climate AI uh, able to pick um, PEST that are resistant um, whereby farmers are trying to control the PEST and they are not maybe able to control those PEST? Does this system also able to pick up any resistance that this, I mean, or any PEST that would have developed? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So the way that we think about um, pests and disease in general, and obviously they can, they're a bit, um, a bit different is we are very focused on the weather and climate components. And so when we work with customers around pests and disease, what the questions we're asking are, um, 
things like how many generations of pests may you have. Um, so there's this concept of pest degree days, similar to growing degree days, the heat unit accumulation that would allow a pest to thrive. Um, or what are the, you know, do we see an increase in the types of conditions um, that would be um, very, uh, a very good condition for the pest. So I, I showed that example of fungus earlier where we can't necessarily say that there will be more fungus in the future, but what we can say is that the key documented thresholds that usually result in this fungus are likely to increase. So we don't provide information necessarily about resistance, but what we do try and do is provide, provide this information around where do we see the risks of specific pests and disease increasing. Um, and with that information, um, you know, target, try and get our, our customers or growers to target um, to target interventions, whether that's a sort of a need for um, new uh, pesticide approaches, new new practices, new new varieties, et cetera. Um, so that's that's how we think about that. But we do certainly do a lot of forecasting around potential pest and disease instance. Uh, and in fact, the ITC example I gave around moving the planting date was a lot around, um, more around uh, the concerns around sort of disease triggers um, and how they might adapt to those. Thank you for the question. Uh, I see uh, Muzi um, Sukadi, I hope I'm from the FAO, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. I see you with your hand up. Uh, please feel free to yeah. ask. Hello. Yes, I wonder if you can hear me well. I can hear you well, yes, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. My name is Muzi Sukati. I am I am from FAO, I'm here in Accra, in Ghana. Uh, so my question maybe is uh, is to do with, uh, okay, we understand the, the, the this, this tool, I think it's a very great presentation. We, we, we really like to appreciate uh, this, this presentation. It's very, very good and, uh, and, and pertinent. But our preoccupation, you know, we when here in Africa, you know, is the is the digital divide, you know, because I think the the issue of climate change is a is a phenomenon that is going to affect everyone. But we also know that uh, I think the 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 poor will be more impacted, you know. We, for example, here in in East, in West Africa, where I am, there are floods, and in Mali, Burkina Faso, it's a serious concern. And you go to South Africa, the Southern Africa, the the Great Zambezi River is dry, dry, dry. There's nothing there. There's no Victoria Falls these days. So I I think it's 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 really a serious issue. But then the thing is, when when we predict these uh, the climatic patterns, you know, where in the use of AI, one of the critical things is the digital divide. You know, the people who are really mostly going to be affected do not have the access to the information to make the, the right decision. So how can we bridge that gap, you know, between the research and going forward with these tools and making sure that we leave no one behind, the people who really need the, the these early warning systems, the, the really vulnerable, who are not educated, who don't have the technology. How do they probably hijack the AI, the, the information that is generated by AI to probably support them better? you know, like in, in a more practical policy policy stance. Thank you. That's that's a really great and important question. Um, I think about it from the perspective of there's really uh, three players, or let's say four players involved in this. One we've already talked about. One is climate AI providing the information. And the other end is the grower receipt who needs to needs to be able to take an action. In between these two sources are two really critical components that we see as, as necessary as table stakes in order to translate information to action. One is a trusted partner of the growers. So for, you know, I, we are not going to be successful going to a rural farmer in Africa or frankly, even the United States or anywhere saying, hi, we're an AI company from, from Silicon Valley. We're here to help and we have all the answers. That's just not going to work. We need people who can um, be a trusted intermediary that have built long relationships with growers that can provide us with the right uh, insights as to what types of decisions these growers can uh, can make because it varies by crop and geography as to like 
how people may be able to act on information, but then can relay our information in, in format and in a language. Um, I mean, both the actual language, but in also just the a manner of speaking um, to growers so that it is trusted. Um, so a good example of that is actually this ITC example where they've spent decades building really deep relationships with growers in India, um, both from the perspective of physical relationships, but also digital ones. Um, and so when those growers receive a message from ITC, they will take an action on it because they trust it. But the other reason that they're able to take an action is the second point, and that's funding. So a lot of interventions, you know, moving a planting date may or may not actually cost that much, if anything at all. But a lot of the interventions that we do see um, may require certain investments, whether that's learning to plant a new variety, or um, of course the concept of, of, of irrigation is really important in certain parts of the world. Um, and so what, what we'd like to see, and so there's a need for resources to make this information more actionable as well. Our, what we see as most effective is when that investment is being made by the, um, the off taker or the person buying from the grower, because then it's not just saying, hey, we're going to finance you, you're going to go into debt and maybe it'll work. It's instead more of a partnership of, hey, you make these interaction interventions. You can increase output and we will buy that output from you. And maybe even we will be able to finance these in investments from, from the crop that you deliver us. And so it's actually kind of reduces your risk as well. And so we're kind of tied together. I think what I have heard, although not, I want to be clear, I'm not speaking from direct experience, but heard one of the challenges within Africa specifically is that there is the role of the, the person, the, the organizations doing a lot of the buying from growers are, let's say, more like value, add, like middlemen or middle people or distributors who don't have the same kind of long-term thinking as like an ITC or other customers that we work with in other markets that are thinking like, yeah, we may not get the return this year, but this is a, a two, three, 10 year relationship. It's a bit more transactional. And so then that's one of the gaps that we have found in trying to penetrate um, the market in, in Africa specifically. Um, but I'm actually, I'm also curious, I see you nodding, but I'm curious if that, if that resonates, but just to recap, it's those two factors access to funding from someone who has the right incentives and a trusted partner to deliver the insights. I think if we have those two things, we can bridge that divide, but those players don't exist in all ecosystems. And that's, I think, that's where we need to sort of do more to develop the ecosystem in certain areas. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you, you've you really touched on a, on a very critical issue there, you know, like the the trust and the and, and the investments, the funding, you know, because I think you raised a very important. I was I was I was working with small scale farmers, you know. Sometimes the people who are the the real private sector, the real actors, they they don't have long term incentives on on the farm. They just come and they get and just bridge the gap, get whatever quick profit they get, and they 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 they, 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 they then they fly over, you know. So it's a case by case. So I think uh, I think it's a it's a critical issue you raised, and how we implicate maybe policymakers and making sure that the the, the the public, the policy, creates the right conducive environment for for for, for these models to work and engaging the investors and the private sector actors. I think it's critical. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for adding that uh, as well. That's good to hear that it, it resonates. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think a lot. It's you know, we. I think. The if I take the example of like Coco, um, it, it's going, I think, in the next three to five years, we are going to see a very significant change in the way that major global companies engage in, um, in, in Africa and West Africa specifically because of the significant Coco losses that we've, we've experienced. Of just an acknowledgement that we need to do so much, they need to do so much more to build capacity, um, in that, uh, in those regions or we're not going to have enough chocolate. And like, that's, you know, personally uh, terrible, but like, it's, it's also, it's like huge for their business. And I think they're waking up. Um, and I, I wish that they're, you know, it wouldn't require such devastating um, heat and drought events to, to cause that. But I do think that we're hearing a lot about that. And I suspect, and I'm optimistic at least that um, there, there will be a, a change in engagement um, 
uh, engagement mode from these sort of large suppliers um, in, in these areas. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Over. Great. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I have uh, just one, Will, just elaborating on the source of the data that you use, you know, access to data um, that's accurate pertaining to a region that's already existing is a major uh, determinant in how well your models are going to work, right? Or how accurate they'll be. And so I was just wondering, you know, across, you know, regions in Africa and in other places, you know, we have places in Guatemala and in the Pacific where VAX is expanding, um, what are the sources of your data? Uh, great question. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked, because I think it's one, <clears throat> you know, there's a reason that I put this number of like 70 plus countries that we work in today, because it's one of the top questions we get. It's like, well, does your data work in our region? And the, the interesting and exciting thing is it's very counterintuitive, but we are actually, we're significantly, our technology is more useful in parts of the world that have less data. And let me sort of be clear about what I mean. Um, so first I, I'm showing this slide as well because I wanna talk about our technology, the two layers of our technology, because that is a different answer. So the forecast layer and then the like yield modeling, the impact layer. I'm gonna talk about the forecast layer for a bit. The fundamentals of our technology are less about using proprietary or novel data sources and more about combining existing data sources um, and then using machine learning to, to pull out from that combination the best possible uh, forecast. So um, for example, take long-term climate, you have dozens and dozens and dozens of long-term climate models. These models are largely, not exclusively, but largely developed in North America and Europe. Um, and so when it, they're ostensibly global models, but they have they exhibit significant biases or repeated sort of errors of like being too warm or too cold everywhere in the world, including the US, um, but more pronounced in, uh, in uh, the global south. What we do is we take um, observed weather data from um, a variety of different sources, um, a combination of sensors, weather sensors and um, satellite information. It's called reanalysis data. And then just compare all these different models and say, first of all, which ones are, were the most accurate for a given point, let's say in, in Ghana or Guatemala, which was the most accurate for specific variables, which was the most accurate for specific days of the year. And then we adjust those forecasts so that the forecast more closely match reality. So for example, maybe the best model in the world for, for a certain point in Ghana is three degrees too warm on average, um, on July 14th, like we will dynamically adjust that to bring it closer to, to, um, to reality and then blend and combine these different models to create effectively a unique forecast for every individual point in the world. Um, in certain cases, like around extreme events, especially in hurricanes, um, where we don't think there is enough data, we're able to take data from uh, things like shipping buoys that are currently used to manage shipping lanes um, but looking at temperature of different depths in the ocean and building AI models specific to each basin. Um, so like the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific, the Gulf, et cetera, um, to model. So that's where we think of adding new data. And we combine those two models together to create our the, the forecast layer that you see. But the point is that that technology of taking the best of best and improving what's out there, we see the biggest uplifts, typically, not always, um, there are some regions in the U.S. that you'd expect to have amazing forecasts and they because they're huge agricultural regions and they just do not for some reason. So I don't know why that is. But um, we, we but it but we often see the best uplift in in these in sort of more data sparse areas in the in the global south. The the other piece I want to say is on this impact model layer, that is where the availability of training data um, within a specific geography matters a lot more. And so for our our yield models, we don't um, 
we, you know, we focus more on larger crops where there's more data and we focus on larger producing countries, which doesn't necessarily, um, it's really dependent on how, what is the level of record keeping within it, within a country and whether we're able to, to train that yield model. But we found, and our customers have found that to be great for where it works, but limiting in other places. And so we've actually just rolled out this new type of modeling where we say, hey, you know what? We can't necessarily link our forecast directly to yield, but we know and can validate with less data, even things like news articles and sort of local prices, market prices, what are the types of weather events, these top three to four weather events that will impact yield and tune our forecasts for those events specifically. We call it a risk outlook. And that's how we're, we're in the process of expanding our, um, our coverage to um, that of this impact layer to places that don't have enough data. And so we started with coffee and moving to cocoa. And these are all, you know, often grown in places in the world that don't have as much access to yield data or coffee is just a really hard crop to model anyway. But we're seeing from our customers that it's really resonating and it's validated and making enabling them to make sort of more informed decisions. So we're really excited to take our global forecast engine and then also build on top of that, that global impact model um, at a higher degree of precision than we've been able to do in the past. Tiffany, I see you're on, uh, on mute. So before I ask another question, because of course I have a follow-up, <laughs> I want to turn it back over to the community. Any other questions? So then I will ask my, my I'll make it um, the last question. I would actually like to do something I haven't done before and turn it over to our attendees. And I am asking our attendees, we see that this these models that Climate AI offers work, right? We have the case study in India. We see that even in places where um, there's limited data, using other forms on the on the you know crops of interest etc using other forms of data helps create accurate models so you know you all have a climate ai has a tool that can be valuable so when i look at the community of practice and the attendees here i am asking you for your feedback what would it take for the people in your regions wherever you are to adapt this kind of technology, right? And when I say people, I mean, for example, your smallholder farmers. What would it need for them? What would what would need to happen? Not just for not for them to trust, to use, to implement the use of this technology. What would be needed? How could that be done? I would love to hear from you. Yeah, you can please speak. Muzi. Uh, make sure you unmute because we can't hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think for when they, the, it will take a lot. <laughs> but but I, I, I just want to say, um, well, the, the, the Africa region is, uh, it's, 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 it's really trying, you know, we, we we uh, through the African Union, especially the the big policymakers. You know, you you know we have a an a, an, um, an artificial intelligence strategy of uh, that that has been developed by African Union twenty twenty six to twenty thirty five. It just came out recently in uh, in, uh, in in March, I think this year, or March or April. So I think a lot of the issues that that the African continent is battling with in embracing technology, technology and the AI issues are there. So my point is, at least the policy support, you know, the leaders, the African leaders, the African Union, the politicians are aware of the significance of where we are going into the future, and at least we are trying, you know, to to strategize, position the continent accordingly. But then a, a strategy is just that, you know, but implementing it is another thing. But at least it, it gives us a roadmap of, of what we are going to expect and what what countries can do to, to better prepare themselves. So 
I will suggest that at least if you if you have some time, you can Google that IT strategy, and I think it can give you a lot of the the political thinking around this this, this space. Thank you. Thank you. See another hand up, um, Wanja, um, uh, Kinutaye. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. If you want to unmute yourself. Hi, sorry, uh, for some reason. Good afternoon, uh, good, good evening in Kenya. Um, my question will be, the IT and the IT policy for the kind of work you are talking about may take a long, long time to get down to the small scale farm, uh, farming community. The reason being, at the moment, especially in Kenya, where I am, uh, farming at that level is actually by the people who uh, we call BBC, the born before computers and this kind of activity requires a conduit an organization that will help them to be able to not only apply but implement and interpret the information they are getting so to me is the synergy between the practice and the finances to be able to come from up to the bottom and the bottom up uh, uh, activities so that whatever we are seeing on the ground uh, is actually addressed and have an impact on the ground. And a case in point, back to the insects, uh, we are working on some of the cryptic insects, uh, we call the scale insects and the mealybugs. And with the climate change, in, uh, especially with the temperature increases, we are seeing a higher number. Unfortunately, these are some of the uh, organisms that the farmers and most of the people on the ground who are in agriculture are not aware of them and even how to control. So I would really like to find a solution on how to address so that the, the pesticides don't work. So how do we work out this and be make, come up with a system that will be able to address such an, an issue and the farmer benefits? Thank you. Yes, do Miss Sami, I see your, your hand up there. Um, and thank you for that last comment. I, I definitely agree that that trusted intermediary is, is so critical. Do Masani, you're welcome to uh, unmute and ask your question or comment. Hello, uh, no, thanks, uh, Tefan. I think there was a question that you've asked what it would take uh, in our region to make sure that this climate AI becomes effective. Well, I think we need to look at the revolutionizing of extension services, because uh, traditionally the extension officers, they are more focused on the reactive, you know, uh, approach whereby now there are floods and, and other things that is affecting farmers. But I think if we can start to be proactive by equipping extension officers with these skills uh, to interpret, um, you know, AI related information and also increasing funding uh, for agriculture in Africa, because when you're looking at uh, the Maputo Declaration of 2003, uh, that actually uh, recommends that African countries should spend more than 10% of their national budget. Um, only four countries that are currently spending 10% of the national budget to agriculture. So I think a balance uh, in, 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 in making sure that there is funding and also looking at the future of, uh, you know, extension services whereby we are more focused, you know, in technology and also creating the village uh, agri park, uh, you know, centers whereby small scale farmers, um, they can access these, uh, you know, type of information. I think if we can 
focus in increasing funding and make sure that the extension officers, they are well prepared to, to respond to this future, um, you know, AI, uh, uh, you know, gadgets and, 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 and systems. Thanks. Thank you, Dumisani. Um, we are reaching the end of the hour. I want to make sure that we are respectful for everyone's time. And so before we leave, I want to take a moment and thank you, Will, so much and Climate AI for your contributions, for sharing with us, for listening to our community of practice and, um, you know, just being a, a partner and part of the VAX movement. Thank you so much. Our next community of practice webinar will happen on November 7th at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it will be led by uh, the International Potato Center and Ellen Keller. So be on the lookout for an email from the VAX Partnership. And we look forward to you joining us again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Will. everyone. Thanks so much for the time.